Are we ready to go? I think so. All right. The first part of this presentation will be about the incredible history of a 700 year old book. There are several centuries for which we have no hard facts, but what we do know is a, a story of amazing survival. At the end of this presentation, we'll view selected pages out of the Haggadah. Here's Spain in the 1300s. The kingdom of Aragon is the purple region at the top right. Part of Aragon uh, is a semi-autonomous principality of Catalonia on the, along the Mediterranean coast. You can see it here. It's, a mer it's merger with Aragon resulted from the marriage of a count of Catalonia with an Aragon princess a couple centuries before the time here. Barcelona is the capital city of, of uh, Catalonia. And Girona and Barcelona, you see over here, uh, were major centers of medieval Jewish learning. The Catalan language is halfway between Spanish and French. And that language and the culture are a distinct nationality. The Jews in Muslim Andalus in southern Spain enjoyed a so-called golden age for most of four centuries, from the 700s to the, to the 1100s. The situation varied over time in different locations, but it was true for the most part in the Arab lands of Andalus. But starting in 1146, Moroccan Berbers gained control over the Andalusian city-states of southern Spain. Their austere fundamentalist version of Islam drove Christians and Jews to flee Andalus for Christian Castile and Aragon, including Catalonia. So when the Sarajevo Haggadah was produced around 1320, the center of Iberian Jewish scholarship was in the Christian North. Christian kings in the 1200s to early 1300s often relied on Jews as ambassadors to other Christian kingdoms and to the Arab kingdoms to the south because the Jews knew Arabic language and culture. They also appointed Jews to offices in finance and medicine and sciences. Unlike Christian nobles, they were not a potential threat to overthrow the king. Now, Jewish life was mostly good in Christian kingdoms of Spain for about two centuries, until the early 1300s. Over time, Christian nobles became resentful that Jews controlled so many positions of, of honor in the court. The 1330s, about a decade after the Sarajevo Haggadah was produced, was the end of the peak of Catalonian Jewish prosperity and influence. So now let's do a, a very quick summary of, of the history of a Haggadah generically. Uh, get, um, in around 220 CE or AD, the Mishnah included a very brief set of instructions for how to conduct a Passover Seder. Remember the temple had just been destroyed a couple uh, 150 years earlier, and so they didn't know how to, they had to start over. And then 600 years later, around 800, a partial Haggadah, almost as notes, in a tiny booklet is the first known written document of that book, and it's part of a siddur, a prayer book. The original of that Haggadah is in the Museum of the Bible in D.C. Um, a bit later, in 860, in response to a request from Spain, the head of the Sura Academy in Babylonia wrote an outline siddur that became the core of traditional Ashkenaz, Sephardi, Mizrahi, and Yemenite Haggadot. It included commentaries and rulings by Talmudic rabbis and their, their successor, Geonim. So it was of lasting influence. The Haggadah was a small part of that document. Now, jumping ahead another uh, 150, a couple hundred years, in the late 1200s, 
was the first known Haggadot as separate little small books, manuscripts. And then a few decades later, in the early 1300s, the first known illuminated Haggadot in the Rhineland and Catalonia, including the Sarajevo Haggadah. Now, uh, Sherry, can we take off the, or how would I take off these pictures of the people so that we can see the full screen? Sherry? Hold on, okay, so what I have done is I've put you on speaker view and I see you less and I see your PowerPoint. That's all I see right now. Okay, you don't see other people? Nope. Okay, good. So note on, on the right, note the initial word, avodim, uh, is illuminated. That's the start of avodim hoyinu. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Now these two Haggadot pages here are from different Haggadot, Haggadot also from, Barcel uh, from uh, Catalonia and are made within the same decade or two as the one we're gonna be talking about. Hey, Les, if you want to uh, tell people how to uh, take the pictures of the videos off, just click on the um, very top of the uh, um, videos. There's a, uh, you know, a, a bar up there which has different ways of looking at it and the simple bar will just take it all off the screen. Okay, what, you want what, do I, what do I click up there? Go, go, go up to the top. I've and lost the video. Yeah, and there's a, a, a bar, a box, uh, a couple of boxes, a gallery view, that kind of thing. K click on the first one. First one is mute, and then stop video, participants. No, no, no. Are you looking at, the, um, uh, at, at all the images on the right-hand side of your screen? Yes. So go to the very top of that image uh, stuff in there. Oh, oh, thank you. Okay, now we can proceed. Um, so here you see a page out I of the, the image. You did? Yeah, I don't see any image. Um, Bela, I'm going to have to mute you. You need to be muted because I don't know what to tell you, but we want to keep going. Okay. Try, try okay. playing with your video. Try playing with your views. Everybody should be up using a speaker view and not the gallery view. Please mute yourself if you're not muted. Okay. So how do we know the Sarajevo Haggadah was made uh, in, Barcel in the Barcelona facility? Uh, on the right, you see a full page out of the Sarajevo Haggadah. And on the left, you see blow-ups of the top and bottom of that page. Um, at the top of the page, you see the seal and crest of the city of Barcelona and Catalonia. After the 1137 union of Catalonia with Aragon, it became part of the seal of the king of Aragon. We'll speak later about the top of the crest having been cropped off and missing. That's not a bad photo. It's really cut off. On the bottom right is the, down here, you see a crest of the Sanz family, S-A-N-Z, which appears damaged by water or wine. You see it's smudged a little bit. So it's difficult to make out, but it's a purple wing on a light shield. And then over on the far left, you see a red rosette on a gold shield. That's the crest of, of Queen Margarita of Aragon. Now, based on these seals and the sun seal repeated elsewhere in the Haggadah, as well as all the gold and silver leaf on expensive parchment, scholars believe this book was likely from Barcelona by a family with connections to the royal court. Now, here you see uh, a recent uh, photograph uh, of a Catalonian flag, and you can see on the Haggadah, the yellow stripes have turned black with age. Uh, but here you can see what it really looks like. Now this blue triangle with the white star, that's the secession flag. Uh, the people of Catalonia want to secede from Spain. As I said, it's a separate nationality. Okay, so why illumination? And why painting specifically on Haggadot? Well, 
The Haggadah is a small book, so it's affordable to purchase a manuscript and to illustrate it. So here you see two Christian uh, uh, illuminated uh, pages. Uh, you, Christians typically would, uh, during the same period, would illuminate psalm books called Psalters, Bibles, New Testaments, and other religious books of that era. So they served as an inspiration and as a design template for these uh, Jewish uh, Haggadot. Note on the right, only the initial letter P is illuminated. Latin has upper and lowercase letters. Hebrew does not. So Hebrew texts illuminate the entire initial word, Latin only the first word letter. You can see several gorgeous medieval Latin, illuminated Latin books at the Museum of the Bible. So how was a, a, a medieval Haggadah made? The Prato Haggadah, P-R-A-T-O, was made in Aragon, perhaps in Catalonia, around the same time as the Sarajevo Haggadah. It's now at the Jewish Theological Seminary Library in New York. Now it's unique because it was never finished. We don't know why, but as a result of partially completed folios, Scholars can see the steps that were used in making the medieval illuminated manuscript. Here you can see the basic scribal text is complete. That involves several steps not shown, such as pre preparation of the parchment and ink, inscribing the parchment with ruling lines to keep the text aligned, and tiny holes hidden by, uh, by, by the binding to inform the artist what words to illuminate. Now, probably an assistant or apprentice then inserted the vowel marks, and that was followed by lead sketches of the side decorations. You can see the lead sketches. The large illuminated letters, you can see here, uh, have a layer of gesso, G-E-S-S-O, -S -S painted on, seen here in tan color. You can see that on these illuminated letters. Gesso is a liquid made out of chalk or gypsum that serves as a grounding for later gilding with gold or color paints. It was mixed with a special red clay so that it would blend in if bits of the gold flaked off. Now multiple layers of gesso were used where gold would be applied to, to raise the letters for a, more, for a more dramatic effect. Now here you see also out of the Prato Haggadah, the word Hakam, the wise son. Uh, in the, uh, it's, can you see how the, the uh, gold is flecked off a little bit and it's mottled, and then you can see the reddish gesso underneath it. Now the Museum of the Bible has a display case and you see on the left stones at the top uh, and ground powder at the bottom made out of those stones and showing and then in between a range of tints and that would be using white lead to, uh, in certain amounts to make the different tints. Now the example shown here uh, the stones are blue is azurite, green is malachite, red is cinnabar, and orange is coral. And on the right you see silver, gold, uh, and platinum leaf. And as I mentioned earlier, white was made from uh, a lead, a white lead. So presumably the Sarajevo Haggadah was used in Catalonia for about 170 years. The heirloom of some wealthy family, the Sanz family, I guess, from the 1320s or so until 1492. <laughs> There were riots, uh, here I've got a bunch of dates. This is the only slide that'll have dates. There were riots after the 1398 bubonic plague, uh, despite two papal bulls that were conde condemning the violence against Jews, but the common belief was the Jews oh, caused the plague. Let's see. Uh, oh, I shouldn't say it's a pl Please either I'm mute or stop talking. I have muted us. What? 
Whoops. <laughs> I muted this. Okay. Uh, the Inquisition started, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in 1391 uh, were, were major riots all over Spain that, that basically almost destroyed the Catalan Jewish communities. Uh, and then, uh, and that's when the Muranos or the Conversas started in 1391. And then in 1478 was started the Spanish Inquisition, leading eventually in, a few years later in 1492 to the expulsion of all the Jews from Spain. Many Hebrew manuscripts were destroyed in each of those events. Owners were murdered or forcibly converted and were in fear of being searched and questioned about any Hebrew documents. This book, Sarajevo Haggadah and a rare few others miraculously survived each of these events. Now, a century after the expulsion from Spain, uh, in 1589, Pope Sixtus V proclaimed a ban on Jewish or Muslim books that included anything against the Catholic faith. Books that failed inspection would be burned in public displays. So now the next known location of the Haggadah is Italy in 1609. That's when the church censor approved it as having no anti-Christian text. And you see here, written in, Lat in um, uh, Latin, revisito, got my cursor on it, revisito per me, Giovanni Dom Vistorini, 1609, which means surveyed by me, Giovanni Domenico di Vistorino, 1609. That one line, this is at the very end of the Haggadah, the very, on the bottom of the last page, that one line is all we know. Everything else is speculation for novelists. We know nothing about the book's whereabouts for the following three centuries. So let's speculate. The book and the family were probably in Northern Italy for at least a century after the expulsion from Spain. Vistorini was probably a priest who knew Hebrew, so very likely a Jewish convert to the church. We know he was not hired for his handwriting ability. The Venice ghetto was locked at night and increasingly overcrowded from 1516 until it was freed by Napoleon in 1797. The square, the square was needed uh, as a market and there was nowhere to expand off the very tiny island. You could walk across it in 10 minutes. So the apartment buildings were the tallest in Venice and Venice became a center of Jewish scholarship during that period. And perhaps the book was there, or perhaps in some other Northern Italian city. It is a 240 mile boat trip from Venice across the Adriatic Sea to Split on the Dalmatian coast of Croatia, and 150 miles from Split inland uh, to Sarajevo. Sarajevo and its Jews prospered with the expansion of the Ottoman Empire in the 1600s and 1700s. Sarajevo became one of the caliphate's major trading cities during that time. There was a significant commerce between Sarajevo and Venice. Sarajevo was a regional market, so Sephardi Jews were mostly poor, but a fair number prospered as medical doctors, pharmacists, printers, uh, timber industry, textiles, and other commercial occupations. They maintained commercial ties to Venice, uh, Trieste, uh, Split, and Ragusa, which is now known as De uh, Dubrovnik, uh, down the Dalmatian coast. The book's ownership, or when it was taken from Italy to Sarajevo, 
or anything else between that 1609 censors mark and the 1890s, almost three centuries later, is a blank space. We just don't know. Now, Bosnia was occupied by Austria-Hungary in 1878 as the Ottoman Empire was collapsing. I'm going to read a, a few couple sentences from the Washington Jewish Week in April of 1985. Quote, Dr. Isaac Levy, the elderly head of the Sarajevo Jewish community in 1985, tells with zest the saga of the Haggadah. As Levy heard the story from his father, then a student at the community-run Maldar, which is the Sephardi term for a, he a header, or, date, or kids' school, elementary school, the youngest of the Cohen boys walked into class one morning carrying an old Hebrew book under his arms. The boy's father, Yosef Cohen, had died shortly before, and the Cohens hoped that the sale of the book, one of their few possessions, would provide a means of survival. Possibly the deceased father knew the book's history, but no living member knew anything about it uh, when this happened in 1894. The Haggadah was soon purchased by the city's Bosnian National Museum. It is believed the Haggadah was sold for the equivalent of about $7,000 in today's value. Now, Vienna was the political and cultural capital of the empire. Volume was sent there for evaluation and repair. It was immediately acclaimed as a masterpiece. The art was exquisite. As for the repairs, an inept conservator cropped the parchments and bungled the rebinding. You can see the picture on the right, how the top of the, uh, the illuminations cut off. Most books with, with such extensive gold leaf and expensive pigments had elaborate bindings, such as the one on the left, hand-tooled kid, embossed of silver or mother of pearl inlay. But the Vietnamese, the Viennese, I'm sorry, Viennese conservator trashed whatever binding was on the book, we have no idea what it was, and replaced it with cheap boards covered with an inappropriate Turkish floral design. Four years later, in 1898, two Vienna scholars published a book about the Haggadah, and a scholar in Budapest published a book about the illustrations. By the way, those books are available as reprints uh, on Amazon. The Haggadah was then forgotten in storage in Vienna for about 15 years. In 1911, the Bosnian National Museum wrote a letter requesting its return. It had simply been forgotten. It took a couple of years to find it, and it was returned to Sarajevo in 1913, so it came through World War I away from the fighting. That's a large museum. We'll be talking more about it later. During World War II, 80% of Sarajevo's Jews were murdered. Hans Fortner was the commanding general of the Wehrmacht's 718th Infantry Division, a new division that was stood up in 1941, immediately after the conquest of Yugoslavia, with the mission of conducting anti-partisan and internal security operations. Fortner was a well-known killer. He was extradited to Yugoslavia after the war to be tried and hanged for ordering his troops to murder or deport Jews and gypsies. The Nazi government wanted to remove the Sarajevo Haggadah as it was a physical symbol of Bosnian historic interfaith cooperation and mutual respect. When General Fortner personally came for the Haggadah uh, in early 1942, the museum director, who was a Catholic ethnic Croat, delayed him by asking for the museum's chief librarian, who was an ethnic Turk and a Muslim religious scholar, to come up to translate. 
uh, this this uh, librarian knew ten languages, so he could translate between Croatian and uh, Serbo-Croatian and uh, German. The librarian hid the small book under the waistband of his pants. He courageously stood there and told the general that some other German officer had already come to take the book a day earlier. Now the thought hit, why would a two-star general with 15,000 men under his command perform such a task? One would normally add, pass such an order from higher headquarters to a colonel on one staff who would then assign the job to a 25-year-old captain or maybe a 30-year-old major. And why this small book from a museum holding thousands of notable artifacts and books? Here's my speculation. This is purely my own. Adolf Hitler lived in Vienna between 1907 and 1913, trying to be accepted into an art school to become a professional painter. He would have been keenly interested in news articles about a book of Jewish medieval fine art. That's just my speculation as to why the general himself felt, felt that he himself had to come to the museum. as to where the orders came from. Now that chief librarian, Dervis Korkut, is the hero of this story. He saved the Sarajevo Haggadah by taking it to a mountain village mosque where the imam shelved it among old Muslim religious books. A couple of months later, Dervis and his young ethnic Albanian, Kosovar wife, servant, hit an equally young Jewish woman fleeing the Nazis. They kept her in their home as a nanny for four months until she relocated to a home in a safer city. For either of these acts, saving the Haggadah, lying to the general, or, or saving um, this young Jewish woman, the entire family could have been executed, and they knew it. They later saved at least one other Jewish woman in their home. After the war, Dervis Korkut opposed the communist regime in his writings, just as he had previously opposed the Nazi regime. The communists imprisoned him for six years, most of it in solitary confinement. Now, notice a little baby who's, who Dervis is holding. We'll come back to her later on. In 1983, so now we've moved forward almost 40 years, the Haggadah was photographed and facsimiles were sold so that it became more widely known. And that's how I first learned about it. The woman the Korkut saved back during the war was now living in Israel. She read about the facsimile and how Dervis saved it. They wrote a and she and another woman wrote uh, to Yad Vashem about how the Dervis and his wife servant had saved their lives. And that got the Korkut's recognition at Yad Vashem. Moving forward another almost a decade, during the 1992 Bosnian War, Serbs attempted to destroy Bosnian culture, in part by demolishing every library. They shelved the Bosnian National Museum, including its library and Haggadah as a principal target. During that time, the location of the Sarajevo Haggadah was a mystery fed by rumors. It was speculated to have been sold to Israel for weapons, an act of treason for this national treasure. It was rumored destroyed. It was rumored temporarily hidden in Israel. To show how dangerous this was, a museum director, Dr. Rizzo Sajari, was killed by a grenade blast in December of 1993 while arranging for holes in the building to be covered by UN plastic sheeting. During the siege of Sarajevo, Servet, by then, then a widow, was given priority by the Jewish community for a bus ride uh, with them out of the city to safety.
On Passover in 1996, the mystery of the book's whereabouts ended. The mayor of Sarajevo was invited to the communal Seder. He walked in with the original of the Sarajevo Haggadah to the Seder. Now here's what really happened. There was combat in the nearby botanical gardens adjacent to the museum. As the museum was being shelled, a nearby basement room was flooded with by burst pipes in the heating system. Uh, so archaeologist, librarian, and museum director Enver, Enver Imamovich, shown here, recruited police officers to assist him in entering the building under fire to rescue the most valuable holdings. They broke open the safe with a hammer and pickaxe to relocate the Haggadah to an underground bank vault elsewhere. Three years later, Servet's daughter, uh, the infant in that photograph that we saw uh, earlier in the World War II photograph, was caught up in the Kosovo War, barely escaping to Macedonia with her family. When she showed the Skopje Macedonia Jewish community a photocopy of her deceased father's Yad Vashem certificate, they arranged for her family to be flown to safety in Israel, where Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu welcomed her at the airport. In late 2002, the Sarajevo Haggadah was placed in its pyramid-shaped display case in the National Museum of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Medieval Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, and Muslim artifacts line the walls, showing their mutual influence. On the right is a Bosnian postage stamp celebrating the artifact as a national artistic treasure and symbol of Bosnian tolerance. The museum closed uh, a decade later in 2012. Employees had not been paid in a year, but remained on duty to protect artifacts of Bosnian heritage. The heat was cut. It was a combination of financial reasons and continued ethnic tensions. The museum reopened in 2015 with funds from the US Embassy and a, a, a bunch of nonprofit groups, including the American Joint Distribution Committee. <clears throat> Geraldine Brooks, an Aussie journalist, learned about the Sarajevo Haggadah and its history as a war correspondent in the 1990s. She published a major article in New Yorker magazine focused on the heroism of Dervis and Servet Corkut. That article is an awesome tale of courage and multiple real life miracles of World War II, the siege of Sarajevo and the Kosovo War. A year later, in 2008, her novel, People of the Book, shown on the left, presented the history of the Haggadah. Uh, the, the periods of several hundred years where we don't really know what happened, she fills in, that's why it's a novel. The novel won the Australian Book of the Year Award and the Australian Literary Fiction Award. It's a great read and a wonderful historical novel. That led to a musical production and a facsimile with digital photography of far higher quality than earlier film photography facsimiles. Armis Brooks popularizing the book was in part responsible for saving the museum. Other facsimiles include a 1973 edition, which I don't recommend due to its outdated film photography and a 2018 edition on the, on the right, published by the National Museum of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is available on amazon.com. The commentary by Hebrew University scholar Shalom Sabar builds on the earlier works. It's a complete and best commentary of any of these, uh, uh, any of these facsimiles. 
So that ends the history of the book as, as much as I'll tell. Now let's go look at uh, pages out of the actual Haggadah. Now first you gotta understand what a folio is. A parchment is made out of usually sheepskin or goat skin. Um, and a folio is the front and back. In other words, both sides, the flesh side and the, and the uh, uh, outside of uh, the hair side of, of, the, of uh, the skin. So a folio is two pages. And they're referred to as recto, meaning on the right, and verso, meaning the reverse. In Hebrew books, unfortunately, recto ends up on the left, so it's a little confusing. The first 30 folios are depictions of the book of the entire book of Genesis and the first half of Exodus up to about chapter 20 or 21, down to the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. The paintings are all on the smooth flesh side of each folio. So the, the point of the exercise is that the purpose of creation through the Exodus from Egypt was fulfilled at Sinai the creation of the Jewish nation under God's laws. So we're going to be looking at these from right to left, the way Hebrew is written. You see folio one on the right. It shows the first three days of creation. Uh, the earth was void, and then div dividing the dark light from the darkness. And then you see at the bottom, firmament in the midst of the waters, and then finally dry land and grass uh, grass and plants. Now you note above each one of these, the seven heavens, which was a normal medieval belief, and God is depicted as a single point of light. Um, pure symbolism, as, as distinct from Christian depictions of that same period of either God as an old man, or at least the hand of God, you know, a hand pointing down, or the eye of God, like such as we still have on the back of our $1 bill. Also note the shape of the arch uh, atop each of the days two through six. Uh, you see the little arch shape of, of here, you see the arch. We'll be seeing, whoa. We'll be seeing that arch shape again. You'll also notice that the earth is shown as being round here and here. All of these, the earth is shown as round. This is two and a half centuries before Columbus and three centuries before Galileo. Folio two on the left shows the sun, the moon, the stars, fish and birds, four-legged animals on day six, including a ray of light on the bottom right picture a ray of light is on a naked man. You see the man right down here. And finally, on day seven is depicted as a man studying on the Sabbath, on Shabbat. In the 1890s, this book, this Haggadah, ended the long-held belief that medieval Jews would not depict human beings. Folio three is on the right making of Eve and eating the forbidden fruit on top and below the expulsion from the garden with fig leaves covering their nakedness. And from here, I skip 28 folios, which covers the whole story of, uh, of Genesis, the flood and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and a whole bunch of folios on Joseph and his saga. And then Exodus, the cross, the, the, 10 plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, all of that I'm skipping for the sake of time. And folio 31 on the left, we see two scenes from the, that are from the end of the Torah, the end of book of Deuteronomy. At the top, you see uh, Moses blessing the people. And at the bottom panel, Moses transferring authority to Joshua at the very tail end of Deuteronomy. In folio 32 on the left, the description in Hebrew down at the bottom says, the holy temple to be built soon in our days. Notice at the top of the temple, the seven heavens, 
repeated above the ark. And that same arch, you see that arch, is the same one that was on the first folios of creation. And immediately on top of the ark, uh, you see like the angel wings here, um, that meet at a gold rosette, repeating the symbols of the Sans family and Queen Margareta of Aragon. You can't read it on this small slide. You see the little bitty gold, but if, if you see it in the actual book, in an actual facsimile, that's good Hebrew, and it's the first two of the Ten Commandments. Uh, the first commandment on the right and the second commandment on the left. And finally, concluding this series of just pictures before the text of the Haggadah starts, are two views of current, then current, Spanish Jewish life. On the right, uh, folio 33, at the top you see the hostess uh, serving communal herosis from a pot, which is used in the Seder ceremony. And at the bottom, uh, the host hands out communal uh, matzah. But you, and you'll notice the boys don't have their heads covered. Hmm. And on folio 30, 34, uh, the only word here is uh, uh, Beit HaMikdash, uh, well, the, the um, I'm saying that wrong, but the synagogue. Um, and you see a family departing the synagogue, heading home to, ha to, to have their Seder at home. Notice the same shape of the arch over the exit door of the synagogue and over the ark in the back, as in the days of creation and in the holy temple. So that everything's all connected together from creation to the temple to the local synagogue. The next folio, which I'm not showing, starts the ceremony with the Kiddush blessing over the wine. So, the, so here you see them departing synagogue to go home and the very next page is, is the blessing over the wine. Now we're skipping a couple. What happens now as it gets into the text of the Haggadah, the folio pages are renumbered starting from one. So the Kiddush was on page one. Uh, I presume that that was the scholars in Vienna who did that back in the 1890s, uh, the numbering. So folio three here on the right is the start of the Magid section, the telling of the story, the core of the Haggadah. So at the top, you see the heavenly Jerusalem with symbols of, Catal of Catalonia at the top and bottom that we discussed earlier. And this is uh, the word in uh, uh, illuminated as ha, as in the beginning of halach ma'anya. Uh, this is the bread of affliction. All who are hungry, come in. Uh, all who are hungry, let them come and eat text and that's the first word of all that text and then on the left on the center you see the four questions manish tana and you see the word ma what or why uh on the on the center and on the left you see the first word of avadim hayinu we were slaves to pharaoh in egypt responding to the four questions now most of the haggadah pages look like these pages here in the center and left. Uh, we're not gonna show you, we're gonna skip a whole bunch, but the bulk of the Haggadah looks like this. Almost every page has illuminated initial words and it, uh, every page has these fun uh, medieval real or fictional animals to raise children's curiosity. Again, I'm skipping about uh, almost 20 folios here and you see the, the uh, popular uh, hymn, Dayenu, uh, which has 15 verses. This is most of the, I think about a, the first dozen or so of them, uh, which symbolize the 15 steps up to the temple. Um, and it starts at the top here, how good has God been to us? And then it starts the first verse. Had he, 
taken us out of Egypt and not brought judgments against them, Dayenu, it would have been enough. And then the second verse, had he brought judgments against them without dividing the sea for us, Dayenu, and so on. And then on the far left, we see uh, uh, folio 25, second temple era Rabban Gamliel teaching his students. Now this is probably an accurate depiction of a medieval teacher with his lash. Some students without head covering, perhaps not required in 14th century Christian Spain. And this illustrates uh, from the text of the Haggadah, Rabban Gamliel used to say, he who does not mention these three things on Passover does not fulfill his obligation, the Paschal offering, the matzah, and bitter herbs. Whoa. The page showing the Paschal offering is just a sketch of a lamb, uh, so I'm not showing that here. It's just a rough sketch. Now on the right, you see the page depicting matzah, and it says matzah zeh. This is matzah with the two men holding it. And on the left, the moror, moror zeh. This is moror. Now every Medieval Haggadah shows a leafed vegetable for the bitter herb or maror, and not horseradish root that we commonly eat today. This one appears to be an artichoke, which is native to the Mediterranean region. Maybe they were for California. All right. And finally, um, folio 31, which is the last illustrated folio in the book. Here you see a Seder table. Uh, some think this, this was by a different uh, artist because it's a little more detail. It likely depicts the family who ordered the Haggadah. Note the African girl, maybe a Moor, or a young woman on the far left. Geraldine Brooks' historical novel has an entire chapter speculating on her story and why she's here. It's a great chapter. Also note the hanging brass lamp. You have a, crisp, a glass lamp here for normal uh, weekday lighting, but this brass lamp here uh, uh, is for only for Shabbat, Sabbath, and holidays. And it's in Spanish, it's called a velon, and it epitomized medieval and early modern Jewish dining tables. In the Rhineland, it was called a Shabbos Sturm or Judenstern. It consists of a star of six or seven oil lamp rays with a cup to catch drippings hanging below. It was lit at the start of Shabbat or a holiday and would remain lit through the night. Now following that, that, in, that, that picture, that ends the, uh, the, the Haggadah text, and that's followed by 55 pages on 828 folio sheets, front and back, of Spanish Jewish liturgical poems in a different calligraphy, a different color ink, and a finer quality parchment with no illustrations. It appears to have been added a bit later than the Haggadah, but it's also Spanish calligraphy from the late 1300s. Remember the Haggadah is from the early 1300s. This long section of about 55 pages does not appear to have been used. It's still clean, unlike the heavily used Haggadah. This is our last slide. Uh, the title of this novel and then two uh, for those who wish to learn more, they can be presented here. Uh, you've got these two articles, one from the New Yorker and one from the New York Times. Uh, and you see my email address at the bottom. Anyone who emails me, I'll be glad to send them copies of these two articles, which tell a whole lot more detail than we had time for about the heroism of the, and the incredible story of the Corkut family. So that is the end of the uh, um, presentation. And now if I can figure out how to, okay, I'm open for if, um, 
Sherry, if you'll open, take the mutes off and we can um, take questions. Well, that, I'll, I'll be honest with you, that's gonna be really hard because believe it or not, we have 102 people on this call. Oh my. So I can't even see all the screens, but what I'd like to do, if people have a question and are willing to do it in their chat, they just type it in the little chat box, I can read it or you can see it. Um, for instance, I have one from Fran Miller. It says, how does this Haggadah differ from others of the same period from other countries, assuming they exist? There's probably, I don't, I don't remember now, one or two dozen Haggadah of this period, all from uh, Northern Spain, Christian Spain, mostly, uh, well, uh, mostly from, uh, or several from the uh, Catalonia or from the Rhineland. Uh, those are the only two places that had Haggadot this early on in the 1300s. Um, I can't fully answer your question. I know that the uh, calligraphy is slightly different between Spain and Germany. In Germany, they used a quill pen, and in Spain, they used a, uh, uh, I think, a, a wood or bamboo or something to, to write with, so it came out with a slightly different calligraphy. Uh, I look through page by page of this Haggadah against a, a modern current printed Haggadah recently, and I went through about half of it, and it looked pretty much identical to what we use today, some minor differences. Now, what it doesn't have in the back of the Haggadah, we have all these uh, hearty drinking songs at the end of the, of the Seder to kind of wake up uh, the kids at the end of a long evening. That didn't exist yet. Instead, you see here, and it's purely in Spain, they had all these poems that they would put in the back. I don't know if that answered your question, but I hope so. Somebody had asked Les if you could repeat your email address. Did you hear that, Les? Yes, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm flipping to it so that people can see it. Oh, okay. I also thought we could put that last slide on the website with those yes. articles. Uh, here it is now. There, it's at the bottom of this. Les Bergen, L-E-S-B-E-R-G-E-N at outlook.com. Okay, I have a couple more questions. Why were images allowed in the, the Sador, I guess, or in the uh, Haggadah? I mean, of people. It's, I, don't, it's, I don't know, it just says from Beverly, why were images allowed? I'm, I'm presuming that's what Beverly meant, because in many centuries, particularly later than this, and especially in Eastern Europe, it was, and, and actually in Germany in the medieval period, uh, it was absolutely forbidden. It was considered a violation of the second uh, commandment to have pictures of people. And, but here you see in Spain, Spain was a little bit more open, um, and not as, as, as strict, I don't know, I'm not using the proper terminology, uh, not as from in, in Yiddish. Uh, and so they clearly didn't have a problem with two dimensional people. Now they wouldn't have had three dimension because that would have been considered idolatry. But you know, they didn't have problems with two dimension. And that was, was a big shock in the 1890s when, that was, when this book was, was brought to Vienna and scholars saw it. It was the first time that anybody knew that in medieval Spain it wasn't a problem. But we don't know the we don't know why it was strict in Germany and not so strict in Spain. Another question from Fred Winter. You didn't mention the 1983 facsimile version printed in, and I'm going to butcher this, La Jubliana, La Jubiliana. What are your thoughts about that one? That's the one I did mention when I mentioned that 1983 was where I first heard about the Haggadah, and that's where the woman who had been saved read about that uh, Ljubljana, which is the capital of uh, um, Slovenia, uh, way up in the north. Uh, that, that's where the, the women who had been saved uh, during World War II by the... Uh, uh, Corkets uh, realized the Corkets were still around and were embarrassed they had never given them credit and got them recognized by Yad Vashem. 
So yes, I did. That book in 1983 was done with film photography. So the, uh, uh, the commentary with it is outstanding. It, it explains each of these pictures, but uh, the photography is nowhere near as, as high a quality as the books that came out later, uh, the two that came out in uh, 2000 and around eight, and now the one that came out in 2018 uh, that were done with digital photography. I remember that now. I have a question from Sylvia Gordon. We each have a Haggadah at our state arena. Because of the elaborateness of this, was there only one at that time read by the leader? Yes, and the answer is, it's more, even if it was handwritten, a manuscript with no pictures, like an average family, this is for a very wealthy family, an average family that would have no elimination, it would only have been one for a family. Uh, because remember, this is uh, centuries before printing had been invented. So these were manuscript, these had to be handwritten. They were expensive even if it had no pictures at all. Um, so the, the idea of everybody having their own little booklet to follow along the, the service is, that's modern, that's uh, 19, maybe 18th at the earliest, but mostly uh, late 19th and really mostly 20th century with cheap, you know, cheap books or Maxwell House, free books. I have a, two comments. Um, one says, the people of the book is available as an ebook from the Fairfax County Library. That's from Phyllis Klein. And there's another one from Bruce Waxman, Bird's Head Haggadah, where people are replaced by birds. Yes, uh, I, was, I didn't mention the name of it, but that's what I was talking about earlier. Uh, Bird's Head Haggadah was from the Rhineland uh, from the same period as this, the early 1300s, and that's actually the oldest one we know about it. It's a little bit, maybe a decade or earlier than this. Uh, modern scholars think those are not birds, but griffins, or a scholar up in uh, Poughkeepsie in Vassar College, who's both religious Jew, but also an art historian. So he makes good argument that those are really griffin heads. But uh, so there in Germany, they would not have depicted people like this. And, and that's how they got around it. I have two questions or statements from people. One is from Fran Miller. I had heard that this Haggadah may have been a wedding present because of the family seals. Is there any proof? There is no proof. We have no knowledge of whether of anything like that. That's, that's speculation and it's reasonable speculation. And the other- oh, pardon, pardon, pardon me, Sherry. It, particularly in the 17 and 1800s, uh, uh, manuscript Haggadot were made for about a century in Germany. They became popular in Austria and they were typically given as wedding presents. So maybe that's where she got the idea. Thank you. And then the last statement slash question from Bruce Waxman is, the Sarajevo Haggadah was taken off view for museum reservations. Is it back on display? I don't know anything about that. Okay. Well, I want to say this was wonderful. There have been a lot of positive chat comments about thanking you, Les, so much for this informative talk. And we had over 100 people on it initially. I hope everybody was able to get some, some something out of it, whether they could see you, see what's going on in the Haggadah, because it's a beautiful book. Um, and I want to thank Shelley Rosenstein for helping us to put this together. This talk was supposed to be uh, a talk at Beth L as an outreach program. And Les was kind enough to bring it to Zoom so that so many people could see it. And I think we got a bigger crowd than we would have gotten at Bethel. So thank you so much. And I hope everybody enjoyed it and will participate in more Zoom virtual programming with the JCC so we can all stay connected and informed and educated and stimulated during this difficult time. Be safe, be healthy all. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.